Okay, I think we're going to get started. Welcome everybody. Um, my name is Kirsty Tate. I'm the Sustainable Farming Lead for the Nature Friendly Farming Network in Scotland. It's great to see so many of you here um, helping us celebrate our Nature Friendly Farming Week. Please do feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat. Um, I've just started off, so do um, tell us where you're from and what you do, and let's get some of that moving. Um, in this webinar, we are going to cel be celebrating species rich grasslands and the farmers and crofters that manage the, these vital and rare habitats, and hopefully inspiring more to do so. So as we know, species rich grasslands were once common across the UK, but in less than half a century, we've lost nearly 97% of these valuable habitats. This loss amounts to nearly 7.5 million acres of wildflower meadows, making the rare and fragmented areas we have left even more vulnerable. We know, though, that there's a growing number of farmers and crofters working to restore and protect these important farm habitats because of their numerous benefits on and off the farm and croft. So we have an amazing panel of farmers and crofters speaking. Um, I'll just quickly get all my panellists to put their videos on so you can have a wee look at them. Um, Nikki Yoxo will be sharing the learning from her mob grazing for biodiversity in the Cairngorms Initiative. And Donald McDonald and Hilary Kehoe will be sharing their learning insights and practice of appropriate grazing and cutting regimes, which benefit species rich, rich grasslands and macker. We're also delighted to have partner Joe Goodall from Plant Life, who will be setting the scene and providing the context. So co-facilitating the webinar with me tonight is our communications manager, Alina Walker. I'm hoping she can put her video on so you can have a wee look at her. Um, so she's been the powerhouse for our Nature Friendly Farming Week. Um, so big applause for her. Um, she'll be helping facilitate the Q&A as we move through the webinar. So just a few bits and pieces on housekeeping. Um, you will see that this session is being recorded. And it will be available to you after this webinar on our NF NFFN YouTube account. You will also see, as this is a webinar, your video and audio has been disabled. However, you do have full use of the Q&A function to post all your questions for our panel. You also have the ability to upvote questions as they're posed. So this will help us with selection for the Q&A sessions later on. Our panel will also be in hand to answer any questions they can using this function. So just to let you know, we'll be splitting the webinar in two. So there'll be two opportunities for Q&A, one after the first two speakers and the second after the next two speakers. Again, just because this webinar is so popular um, and, and the t within the time we have, we might not be able to get through all your questions, but we will endeavour to do it very best between us. So without much further ado, let's get started. So first up is Joe from Plant Life. Plant Life is the international conservation membership charity working to secure a world rich in wild plants and fungi. And it's the only UK membership charity dedicated to conserving wild plants and fungi in their natural habitats and helping people to enjoy and learn about them. So Joe's presentation is titled Valuing the Vital, the Importance of Species Rich Grasslands. So if I can get all the panellists apart from Joe now to put their cameras off and I will hand over to Joe. And Joe, just let me know when you want the slides um, changed. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Kirsty. And it's fantastic to be here with some brilliant farmers talking about my favourite topic, species rich grasslands. Um, as Kirsty said, I'm Joe Riggle, Grassland Advocacy Officer at Plant Life. Next slide, please. Um, so yeah, with, with an international conservation charity working to secure a world that's rich in wild plants and fungi, we have over 15,000 members and supporters, and we work with a really broad range of people and organisations. That's from farmers to other NGOs and government. And just to say before we begin, I work within our policy team. So sadly, I'm not a botanist, but we do have lots of those working in plant life as well. Next slide, please. Definitions. What do we mean by species-rich grassland? 
it's quite tricky to define and there's lots of definitions relating to grassland. So here are just a few. You can see on the left that species rich grassland compared to improved grassland has a greater number of plant species per square meter and a lower coverage of white clover and ryegrass, which are the more virulent species. Improved grassland on the right, that's been agriculturally managed to increase productivity and is often pretty species poor. And then unimproved or semi-natural grassland, now that's habitat that is quite hard to formally define, but it's usually got low intensity management with little to no inputs. Um, and often it can be classified as species rich as well. So you can perhaps imagine this as a spectrum of increasing species richness. And a couple of other important definitions. Um, so in agricultural policy terms, we've got permanent grassland. Now that's land that's been in grass or other herbaceous forage, um, which has not been included in the crop rotation for five or more consecutive years. Um, contrast that with temporary grassland, which is fewer than five years. Um, for example, herbal lays often replowed um, as part of arable rotations. So next slide, please. Grasslands um, are under threat, um, but actually grasslands in total cover over 40% of UK land. However, the majority of this is that agriculturally improved grassland I just mentioned, often species poor, um, the photos on the right of the slide. Around 1% to 3% of that could be described as species rich, but that is often in really small isolated fragments. So we've lost so much of this grassland, as Kersey said in the introduction. Some of the main threats, um, housing development, large infrastructure projects, sale of public land, pollution, especially nitrogen from agriculture and transport, and some more intensive agricultural practices, such as herbicides, fertilizer, um, drainage and reseeding especially when those seed mixes are of more monoculture grass types. Um, overgrazing, but also neglect and undergrazing because that can allow scrub and again, those more, more virulent plant species to dominate. And just to say, although we're focusing on agriculture today, um, that's not to minimize the other pressures to species rich grassland. But I think what's really exciting is that farmers can be part of the solution um, and support the recovery of species rich grassland. And I'm sure the other presenters will talk more about this later on. Next slide, please, Kirsty. Um, so just uh, a little bit about the history, um, just as we wait for the slide to come on. Uh, but just to consider changes in agricultural management. So looking at this image, you can understand why in the past there were so many traditional hay meadows and pastures in the early 1900s. And that was to feed the three and a quarter million horses that were in Britain, many of these working on farms. And I think that's a fantastic image um, from our past. Next slide. And in the next slide, you'll see a very different image because following the Second World War, it became government policy to incentivize increased agricultural productivity. So farmers were told it, they needed to produce more food and the EU payment scheme would pay them to do so. So that meant fewer and fewer hay meadows and uh, species rich permanent pasture and more and more of this temporary grassland, improved grassland and arable land. Next slide, please. Um, but why, you know, why should we care? Well, first, you've got their inherent beauty, and I'm sure everyone on this call will agree that they are spectacular, um, as well as their place within our culture and our heritage, inspiring poems, art, and even street names. And I suppose somewhat ironic that housing developments, as you can see there on the street sign, so often uh, commemorate what they destroy in name. Um, next slide, please benefit to wildlife. So they can support um, over 20% of UK plant species. Um, calcareous grassland, a particular grassland type is amazing. One meter squared can support over 40 flowering plant species. Um, the life cycles of many invertebrates also depend on grasslands as well as many species of bird. However, there's a worrying statistic um, that since the 1970s, we've lost of, sorry, 63% of farmland bird species have actually decreased and decline in their habitats is a key reason for that. 
And finally, if you saw the Wild Isles Grassland episode like I did, then you know that it showcased some of the other lovely wildlife who call grasslands home. Next slide, please. And in this one, we talk about ecosystem service and benefits. Species rich grasslands actually require low soil fertility, which means ideally no fertilizer and no or very little pesticides. And so reducing or stopping fertilizer that prevents carbon emissions from entering the atmosphere um, due to its manufacture, but it also saves farmers money on costly inputs. And so it reduces the emissions of nitrogen oxides and ammonias. Um, and these can be really harmful because they can cause acidification, direct damage to vegetation, um, as well as nutrient enrichment that enables those nitrogen loving plant species like nettles to outcompete others. And ammonia emissions, they also have implications for human health as well, as ammonia can form particulate matter in the air. So species rich grasslands um, contribute to cleaner air and water as well. They can help mitigate flooding events, um, reducing water runoff and soil loss. And in particular, yeah, I'm thinking about floodplain meadows because they're really good at absorbing and storing flood water. Nectar rich grasslands, uh, they're vital for pollinators. And there's been estimates that pollinators contribute um, 400 million per year to the UK economy. And not last, um, not least, livestock grazing is very often needed to maintain that specific vegetation structure and diversity. So species rich grassland also supports food production, which is obviously incredibly important. Next slide, please. They have an important role as well in climate change mitigation and adaptation. Um, soils contain the largest pool of terrestrial carbon in the UK and permanent grasslands are really significant carbon stores. Around 90% of grasslands total carbon is stored below ground. However, plowing or other disturbances of soils that can then release the carbon back into the atmosphere. And it's estimated that around 60% of soil carbon um, in grasslands is stored at depths between 30 and 100 centimetres. However, when you look at current carbon measurement and accounting methods, often they underestimate the soil organic carbon in grasslands because they only measure to the top 15 centimetres of soil. Uh, and you compare that to other habitat carbon stores that are measured to 100 centimetres. So this really risks undervaluing actually the carbon storage potential of many grasslands. And recently you've got estimates for permanent grasslands in Great Britain that have suggested they could store more than 2 billion tonnes of carbon to a depth of 100 centimetres. So they really are an important carbon store. Next slide, please. I love this image. Um, so the diversity of plants roots and their rooting strategies that really appears to be key for carbon storage in the soil and that's because you've got different plant communities and species rich grassland when you compare that to the monoculture grasslands they can access different nutrients and water below ground and that increases their root biomass and then also increases carbon sequestration and species richness, it's linked to greater abundance and activity of soil microbes, mycorrhizal fungi um, and ecosystem engineers. And that's your earthworms and ants, for example. And these facilitate greater sequestration and storage of soil organic carbon. But management approaches are also really important So more extensive management supports species richness, while that intensive management can reduce species diversity and productivity and that impacts carbon storage. Um, and these intensive practices, they can also reduce the organic litter inputs and increase soil exposure and compaction, all of those leading to an overall decrease in soil carbon. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so here are just some of the challenges and opportunities for grassland policy. The farmers, they clearly have a huge role to play in managing land and they need the right support and agri-environment schemes are so important. Um, but it's not just about funding for cre uh, creation and restoration of habitats. Species-rich grasslands particularly really need active management. So we need schemes to reflect this. We need better data and guidance for farmers to help navigate the sometimes complex management approaches and decisions. And we also need recognition 
or greater recognition of grasslands as a nature-based solution to climate change. Um, so that should then attract climate funds, opportunities for private markets, particularly so that farmers um, can access both private and public funding. And in fact, Plant Life um, have recently commissioned research into how farmers can manage their semi-natural and species rich grassland as part of an economically viable business, which is exciting. Um, there's also the legal definition and also protection of ancient grassland. Uh, and finally, alongside other um, organisations, including NFFN, Plant Life are calling for the government to commit to developing a grassland action plan for England, which would be an equivalent to the existing tree and action, uh, tree and peat action plans. That's because ultimately we need governments in the UK to understand the real value of species rich grassland, take a far more strategic approach to grassland policies in order to meet commitments on nature restoration, habitat recovery, net zero, all the while supporting the farmers who are very much at the heart of all this. And I believe my final slide is a thank you. Brilliant, thanks very much. Perfect, thank you. That's been fantastic, Jo. I'm going to very quickly, oh, if I can change my slides on my computer. Um, Introduce Nikki next. So Nikki's going to present next. So just a quick introduction to Nikki. Nikki Oxell is an educator and first generation farmer based in North East Scotland. Um, she's got interest in holistic management, agroforestry, native bee cattle and connecting folk with food. So she's a hugely valued member, steering group member of NFFN here in Scotland and also works for Pasture for Life um, as their um, regional coordinator and supporting links between her research and knowledge exchange. Um, and she is also um, works with Land Workers Alliance and sits on the board of Nature Scott. So Nikki is going to share findings from the mob grazing in the Cairngorms initiative. Um, and I will hand over to her now and stop sharing my screen and let her share her screen. Thanks, Kirsty. I realised I probably need to send you an updated bio um, because my job title has changed and uh, I don't do any work for the Land Workers Alliance anymore. But never mind. That's no fine. We can uh, we, we can come to that later. But um, yeah, delighted to be here this evening. Um, I'm going to turn my video off now I am sharing my screen um, just because I have pretty dodgy Internet. Um, so hopefully you can see that. OK, um, so let me just stop my video and check what time we're on so that I don't run over. Cool. So, yeah, I'm going to, uh, Joe has done a brilliant job um, highlighting the, the wonder that is species rich grassland. And I'm going to talk, um, talk you through a project that we uh, led, Pasture for Life led in the um, Cairngorm National Park for the last two years. Um, and it was a collaborative effort. Uh, lots of different organizations involved, which I'll go through in a second. Um, but this is, uh, we've had that overview from Joe, which tells us kind of where we want to get to. Species rich grassland obviously is the kind of um, the, the gold standard, if you like, for, for many in terms of what grassland could or should look like. And I think that debate is an interesting one. Um, but what we wanted to do was actually implement a project that helped farmers shift along that brilliant spectrum that Joe shared. So we had that, you know, kind of species rich grassland, semi natural unimproved, and then improved grassland. Um, and this was in response to some concerns from the Ken. National Park. So I was in a meeting a couple of years ago uh, with a range of people um, from all different kind of uh, uh, conservation organizations talking to the National Park about how do we get more farmers to value and implement species rich grassland management on their farms, particularly within a context where in Scotland our agri-environment scheme for species rich grassland creation had been put on pause. Um, so there has been real challenges around you know helping that shift to happen particularly other issues around um, that Joe's covered around like afforestation, undergrazing, overgrazing, et cetera. Um, and because of my experience as a farmer and the way that I have been implementing mob grazing for the last five years, I'd been noticing um, the opportunity that the rest periods in mob grazing actually gave for plant species to um, fully express themselves in their flowering. And so I suggested to this meeting, well, maybe we could do something about mob grazing. And then two years later, here we are having completed a project with another year to go with another group of farmers. So my job today is just to go through what that project was and to highlight what a project like this could do for groups of farmers to make that shift. So not necessarily going all the way to species rich grassland, but how do we start shifting people along that spectrum? 
So the project, as I said, um, was developed in response to stakeholder concerns, and it was led by Pasture for Life, but in very close working relationships with the Nature Friendly Farming Network, the Cairngorm National Park Authority, um, Plant Life Scotland, and the Cairngorms Trust, who actually supported Year One by providing re green recovery funding. And we also worked closely with colleagues from the RSPB Scotland um, team and also Nature Scott, which for those of you not in Scotland is, uh, if you're in England, it's the equivalent of uh, Natural England. And if you're in Wales, it would be the equivalent of Natural Resources Wales. So um, it's a, a government uh, body that, that oversees um, nature restoration within Scotland. So we work very closely with different people um, to pull this project together. And you can see me in my absolute element there with a group of farmers out on a farm doing um, plant ID. And what we decided was that we would take five farms originally. Sadly, we lost uh, a farmer from the project uh, just because he had other commitments and wasn't able to engage fully with the project. But so we ended up with four farms and we created this project that gave plant identification training to our farmers. Um, we gave a kit grant of a thousand pounds to each farmer. We put in place mentoring. So each of our farmers was buddied up with a mentor, um, most of them local, some not so local. And that was definitely a learning point for us. We needed our mentors to be more locally based. Um, we put in place training that we also opened out to other people. So other folk could come along and engage with that who weren't necessarily part of the project. We ran a number of farm walks, both on the farms where we were engaged in the project. And you can see Bobby with his solar water pump that he bought using the grants. So this was a farm walk on his farm. Um, but we also um, ran farm walks on other farms to help the farmers kind of inspire them as to what else they could be doing and, and other management outcomes. We had a, a very active WhatsApp group and we also brought in citizen scientist surveyors who um, plant who were doing our plant surveys, all trained by Plant Life, um, who I cannot um, who I cannot be grateful enough for. Plant Life Scotland did an incredible job of supporting this project. And without them, I really don't think it would have been as successful as it was. In terms of our participants, uh, the four farms I thought were a really nice spread. So we had one who was very much a nature focused grazier. So they had cattle, very much using them as a tool. It wasn't about kind of production or output, but it was about using the cattle as a tool to restore nature on, a, on some land that they'd bought a number of years ago. We had two production focused large farms that were selling into conventional markets. And so obviously had all of the um, requirements for them in terms of, you know, number amount of output and how many animals they were able to sell. And we had one farm that was production focused, but they were selling direct into their own farm shops. So there was an added value piece there. And then we also had citizen surveyors. So as I said, these students, retired ecologists, local enthusiasts that plant life trained up and coordinated to get them out onto farm to undertake surveys. Um, and I think this was such a key part of the project because it connected local people with the farmers and it actually brought a very kind of collective approach to these grasslands. They weren't just owned by the farmers, but that we all, whoever we are, had a, had a kind of, um, had a role to play in supporting their management and, and demonstrating our passion and enthusiasm for them. And what was absolutely brilliant to see was that these amazing surveyors put in 250 volunteer hours to go out and do surveys on our farms. Um, in those 250 hours, they surveyed 326 quadrats, which was absolutely brilliant. Um, and they found an average number of in 40, what they called interesting species on farm. And that didn't include some of the, the more ubiquitous things, for example, like plantain, or um, there were some clovers that weren't included, for example. But in terms of the ones that would tick the interesting species, species rich box, the average number was 40 across the farms, um, having engaged in the project, which was just phenomenal. Um, and one of the things that we did was actually to create a booklet for every farm that showed all of the survey points uh, on their farm, all of the quadrats and all of the different species that they were found. And it was lovely to see them all at our end of project dinner, reading their booklets, very proudly uh, comparing their notes on what, what different plant, plants had been found on their farms. And I would say that um, you know, community was a really, really important part of this project. So um, you know, we ran these farm walks, we brought people together. I talked about it being four farmers, but you can see from the photograph on the right hand side, we had many, many more people that were coming together to learn about these different approaches. And actually, I'd say that mob grazing is quite often considered as being quite a kind of intensive um, 
approach to management. And it was interesting, Joe mentioned, you know, grass, species rich grasslands need to be managed in an extensive way. And this is something at Pasture for Life, we're having a kind of internal debate at the moment, because actually, the way that we would manage these grasslands, if we're using mob grazing or adaptive multi paddock grazing or within a holistic management framework, they're actually very um, kind of intellectually intensive. You know, there's a level of um, intellectual engagement that you need to have with the planning of your grazing. They're very knowledge intensive systems. So actually, whilst we might talk about, you know, low and lowering num animals numbers to make them more extensive, that wasn't actually necessarily what we see through these approaches. So there is some tension there between, you know, we need fewer animals in order to make these systems more extensive, but actually we can shift our practice towards these more mob grazing approaches, which actually can increase the carrying capacity of the land and mean that we end up with even more animals. Um, and so there's definitely some debate and discussion to be had around these points. And there is a significant hole in the evidence, you know, Know, we just don't have the research into these systems, mostly because they are um, kind of newly being implemented in the last sort of 10 years. And, and research tends to be about five years behind where, where farming practice is in a lot of instances. Um, and we also find that they are uh, difficult to research because they are so adaptive. They don't fit um, kind of reductionist experimental protocols and design. So we end up with systems being ex explored that don't really re reference or reflect reality on the ground. But this idea of community and bringing people together to share their ideas around, you know, what extensive versus intensive and how we might manage these animals and how we might move them across the landscape and how we create the all important rest, which allows that flowering period to happen, um, is, is what really did make this project very special. And you can see from our very lively WhatsApp conversations that we had discussions, everything from electric fence testers, um, what, what works or what doesn't. And I'm, you know, I would say the uh, the recommendations or not from the um, uh, from the participants are no, not necessarily endorsed by Pasture for Life. So, um, you know, various uh, various different um, uh testing and equipment available. Um, also great to see that farmers were sharing um, where their cows were, how they were doing and sharing pictures of all the different plants that were on their farms. And then also our brilliant volunteers out on out on farms um, sharing the uh, sharing what they were what they were seeing um, with others through the WhatsApp group. So just an absolutely brilliant way to really highlight you know, what's this plant? I've seen this. What is it? And I think one of the things that really worked for our farmers is that we were also able to talk about the livestock health benefits of some of these plants that they were suddenly seeing on their pastures. For example, bird's foot trefoil, absolutely brilliant plant, quite high in tannins, which means it has natural anthelmintic um, properties. It's a legume, so it helps to fix nitrogen. But unlike clover, it doesn't necessarily cause bloat. So these were the sorts of things that we found, you know, not only did we need to share um, the plant names and identification, we also needed to share some of these wider, if you like, technical term ecosystem service benefits, but you know, how these how these plants actually fitted into the farming system. We also needed to make sure that we were able to collaborate effectively with others in other stakeholders, if you like, in the project. So this part of the Cairngorm National Park is really, really important way to bird habitat. Um, and quite often people are say, oh, it looks really open, there's not enough hedges, but actually there's kind of been a lot of work done to try and keep some of the landscapes more open so that they are more attractive to, to wader birds coming in to nest and to feed. So we needed to work closely with RSPB and the National Park around making sure that our wader survey boundaries um, and how they interacted with our mob grazing project. So you can see on this farm at the bottom left, those two areas intersected. So we wanted to understand what did that mean for the plant, um, not only for the plants, but also the wider implications for wildlife life and very very little is known about how in terms of research in terms uh, about how um, these sorts of grazing approaches interact with with wader birds so something that we're really trying to build an understanding of with colleagues we also knew that there was existing species rich grassland so we needed to think okay well if this is in good condition at the moment how do we want to make sure we don't put that at risk we also had the production aims of farms to, to manage as well and the family dynamics where maybe decision makers in the farm and people that wanted to be involved in the project weren't necessarily the same person. So how do we bring the wider farm um, decision making family, if you like, on board with what was happening? Um, I'm conscious of time, so I know there's probably lots of questions, so I'm going to crack on and come to, to an end, but I thought this was a brilliant um, summary from one of our farmers who said, you know, they've seen good 
uh, signed. It was very early. We only were running, you know, a year's worth of planning and then a year's worth of doing. Really, these projects need to be at least three years so that you can start getting some good data from them. But actually, we could see already that there were previously unrecorded um, plants that were coming through, like the spotted orchid, which was just an absolute delight to see feedback like that. Also, that taller sward, that longer sward was giving perfect habitat for field voles, leading to kestrel and owl species being more abundant. Um, no worm is being used, dung pats breaking down quickly and trampled grass contributing to organic matter and as a result, healthy population of earthworms. Furthermore, the system change that was enabled by this sort of process. Remember, we did all of this because we were thinking about species rich grassland and how can we make these grasslands a bit more species rich? And actually what it led to was significant reductions in fertilizer. Um, there was one farm that said, well, we actually just cut out our mid grazing fertilizer applications. We just ditched that. Remembering at a time that this was when 900 pound a ton for fertilizer. So that was a good outcome. And one of our farmers just managed to completely stop worming and fluking cows. Um, and they're now using egg counts to monitor that because they realized with this grazing system there were those additional benefits so absolutely brilliant to see these wider system change um wider system changes that were happening as part of the as part of this project um and definitely something we want to be able to take forward um so if you want any more information about the project uh, my contact details are on there please do get in touch um you can find us on social media pasture for life um or if you're looking for me then you can find me at how mill um and my as i said my contact details are there so happy to share more information about <laughs> you you muted yourself very early there <laughs> That was fantastic, Nikki and Joe. I mean, really, really kept the time. I'm going to really encourage everybody do post out your questions. Um, we've had a couple that Joe has um, answered, but I think I'm going to go into um, there's a question about dock management in Wildflower at Hayfield from Lisa Williams Files Flock. So she says, and this I'll put this to Nikki. Um, in the past, I've pulled the dock heads year in, year out, which was epic. I took six weeks of hard daily slog. That is not sustainable. So I invest in a battery brush cutter, which is working well, but means the huge number of dot beetles are affected. How can I have a win-win outcome where the dot beetles don't suffer? Um, dot management doesn't have kill me, and my hair is clean of dot seed. Um, thank you. So not challenging at all. <laughs> so Nikki, what what what's your uh, advice on dot management? Uh, Kirsty knows me well and knows that I'm a big fan of docks uh, and also the dock beetle is my favorite insect ever it's just amazing and if you don't know what they look like go and look them up it's like a child would draw a beetle it's just amazing um so I guess it's about long-term outcomes so I often talk to people about not worrying about docks because they're doing a job and actually we try and think on our farm for example um that the plants that we see are symptomatic, not necessarily problematic. So dockens of quite often are an indicator of high nutrients in the soil. So nitrogen, for example, um, quite often from dung deposition and urine deposition, but also compaction. Um, so you often find them where there have been animals loafing for long periods of time, where they kind of hang out under trees and they get up and do a poo or a wee and they've been lying there. So it's all compacted. And you'll also tend to find them around gateways and kind of areas that have heavy traffic. So they're, they're very deep dock, um, tap roots actually kind of smash through the soil. And quite often we see that people put things like chicory into herbal lay mixes to address compaction when docks are nature's way of doing that for us. I totally understand that you don't want to have dock seeds in your hay because um, you're concerned maybe about the dock seeds spreading. But something that we often forget in, um, in how plants kind of um, uh, find their niche is that not only does the plant need soil it needs the right kind of niche and it needs the right um, conditions to grow so you could have dock seeds falling into really healthy soils and actually they don't kind of grow because the ecosystem is sort of you know doesn't necessarily need them to these are all things that we're not very good at kind of understanding particularly well or putting scientific names to so um Long term, I would say, you know, think about what are those docks telling you about that bit of land? Is it really high in nutrients? Is it compacted? Dig some holes, start actually looking below the ground. Um, soil Mentor is a brilliant app that you can use to help you guide you through those soil um, that, you know, those soil interactions and thinking about what's going on there. Um, and I would I would say don't worry about it. And over time, 
it will take time, but they will go. And I can just see that someone's jumped in to say doxies are highly nutritious. They absolutely are. They're so good for plants, particularly when there's heavy uh, for for birds when there's heavy snow on the ground. So um, for some reason, we, well, I won't go into the detail, but you know, docs do exist on the injurious weeds list. Don't know what injury they ever did to anybody, but there we go. Um, but I would say, you know, don't worry too much. Though I appreciate for some people that is a step too far, but other than weed wiping, which is probably something you don't want to do, um, and I wouldn't recommend, then um, yeah, that's probably your best option is patience. That's fantastic, Nikki. Um, Lisa's got back and just said she loves docs and beetles like us all, but I think Ed, it's making her hay quite hard to sell. Um, she doesn't know the history of the field. So yeah, good advice there and that kind of longer term view. And I will also recommend Soil Mentor. It, um, it's, it is a really good app that allows you just a, a really good insight into your soils and your plants. So yeah, I'll put a link into that in the resources that we share afterwards. So here is a question from Barbara. Um, what is the animal ratio per acre for mob grazing? Uh, well, the standard answer is it depends. And that is the answer, the standard answer for all mob grazing related questions. Um, it really, really does depend. It depends on the time of year. You can see this photo behind me. Um, this is the, the wee mob when they first started, two heifers in grass that's taller than them. Um, and obviously the the uh, impact that they're going to have when they've got that much biomass to contend with is very different to, it, for example, in the winter um, when uh, the grass is dormant. So it really does depend. I would highly recommend having a look at the Soil Association's YouTube channel. There was a whole range of videos that were um, created by mob grazing folk. Um, and there's also a brilliant video that my colleague Clem Sanderson, um, quite a sort of a longer film did for the Soil Association on tall grass grazing. Um, that that's definitely a good place to start. And then there are other, um, and it's all based in the UK, so it's very UK context specific. Um, so that's a really, really good place to start with. There's also a very lively mob grazing WhatsApp group, which I um, am an admin for. If any of you are interested in joining that, then um, I'm sure after the, as the recording goes out, my contact details will be on there. You can get in touch and I'm happy to um, add you to that WhatsApp group. Uh, so yeah, it's, as I said, it depends. There's so many different variables, um, but there are lots and lots of people who can give you the detail that, and have more time than we do in this webinar. Definitely. Um, next question from Rick is, how do you balance quick rotation in times of fast sward growth with the need to rest pastures long enough for flowers to mature? Did you see that one? Yeah, sorry, I just had too many windows open and lost <laughs> my mute. Um, so what we tend to do when you're fast moving, that doesn't necessarily mean you have to move more frequently. What you can do is to move into bigger paddocks. So, for example, the thing that stays the constant for us on our farm, because it works for us, is moving them every single, like once a day, every day. So when the grass is really cranking, like it is now, we give them much bigger paddocks than we would in the dormant season. So for example, in the dormant season, they might be on, I know, 20 head of animals in half an acre for a day. Um, in the, or even less than half an acre, depending on weather conditions. Just now we might have, for example, 20 head in up to um, an acre and a half a day. And that's just to get them across the grazing platform as quickly as we can. So it's kind of a skim graze. Um, and that then means that actually there's lots of plants that don't get eaten. So I've just taken animals out of a paddock today and gone back through. I mean, we're up in the northeast of Scotland, so it's pretty, um, we're much further behind many of you are in terms of what plants are coming up at the moment. Um, but, you know, I can see, for example, that there are flowering plants that haven't been disturbed. They've just sort of been maybe slightly, a couple of the leaves have been trodden on, but they will continue to flower. And what we actually find is that the flowering period is extended because where some plants do get bitten off um, they will come back for a second flowering and I would really recommend sorry lots of recommendations for other resources but go and look up Rob Havard's um, webinars that he's done uh, we've done them with him through Pasture for Life some brilliant examples of how he's managing highly species rich pasture using these grazing approaches and when he moves his animals out of a pasture there's loads of flowers left behind so actually um, that's one way you can do it the other way is that you can um, do something called a total graze which is actually where you can graze down really hard so you're holding the animals on a smaller area but it gives more time to allow 
the plants ahead of you to grow. Um, I would say that it's quite a difficult one to manage if you're brand new to mob grazing. Most people to come to total grazing after they've been kind of testing the system for a bit um, because it can leave you stuck if you graze everything down and then we have a drought and nothing regrows. So it, it takes kind of experience and practice. But um, yeah, two examples there that, that can help with that. Brilliant. Can I just remind everybody to post their questions in the Q&A box? It's quite hard to trap them in the chat box. I do see there's a couple of questions in the chat box. Sorry, I've, I should have uh, been very clear. Chat box for introducing questions for panellists into the Q&A box. So I think if people who have posted, can you re cut and paste and put it into the Q&A box so we can keep track? Um, and also to say, um, we'll be collating all uh, our list of resources after this uh, webinar and sharing it with our attendees. So I will pick up on what uh, the contacts that, and the um, re references that Nikki has said, and we'll share it with you. A um, uh, uh, question in for Phil Philidia. We are converting a rye grass and clover lay that has been in an arable rotation into permanent pasture. Beyond mob grazing, what would your approach be to establish more diversity? Do you think about what do you think about overseeding? What? Yeah, over. Do you want me to go for that, Joe? Or do you, Joe? Do you want to? Yeah. <laughs> Joe's like, Joe can tell you the policy <laughs> implications, maybe, uh, which I think is really, really important. Um, yeah, overseeding, definitely stitching in. That can definitely be something um, I try at all costs to avoid driving any vehicles over ever any land. Uh, brilliant statistic I heard the other day in 1970, the axle weight of a tractor is one and a half tonnes. The average axle weight of a tractor now is 11 tonnes. Our soils were not designed to cope with that. And it doesn't matter how low pressure tyre you go, our soils were not designed to cope with that rolling over them. So the less you can put tractors on the land, the better, though, obviously, you have to weigh up the implications of, of you know, undertaking that work. So, yes, you could be stitching in. Um, I would also recommend species rich bale grazing, something that we've been testing and we actually are running a bale grazing field lab um, supported by the Soil Association Innovative Farmers. Um, we have six farmers um, across the UK uh, who are engaged in uh, assessing the different um, forage quality, quantity and soil health implications from bale grazing, which is where you basically put a bale on the ground, roll it out and the animals feed on that in the winter. Um, a number of us in that process are actually using bales that we've brought in from species rich grasslands so that they're full of different amazing seeds um, and actually then as the cattle uh, you can do it with sheep but as the cattle are eating um, they are pushing some of that seed into the ground where the bale was they're also eating some of that seed and then obviously going off and it's then in their in their pats uh, and they're starting to grow around the field so they're actually distributing it around so yeah I think that idea of kind of species rich bale grazing needs more research but a number of us are doing it and it seems to be working quite well um and yeah it can be a really nice way of not just um paying as an input but you're also getting the feed uh, quality and, and quantity as, a, as an output as well so it can help you manage your winter feeding requirements too fantastic i've got i think one i'll take one final question before we move on um this is from jill um and I, I don't know if this is more observation, but it might be something that you and Joe and uh, Nikki can um, suggest or have, have insights into. So she states, wish we could find a way for younger families to run systems like Nikki's in areas of small holders, small holdings and cross to support those of us older who would love to have our land mobbed grazed, but either less capable or a little too hard. Share between a bunch of cross and then the herd is viable and land benefits shared. So any thoughts, insights into that? I mean, I don't know, Nikki, you're in Scotland and Joe's in England, so there might be things going on that um, yeah, you can share to, with the audience. Yeah, shall I just kick off briefly? Thank you. Um, so absolutely right, Jill. Um, I think this really demonstrates the importance of of using and drawing on the skills that farmers and crofters already have. Um, and kind of yeah, it's really hard to do this stuff sometimes. And so getting people together, as Nikki has demonstrated and talked about, is so important. Um, and I believe with the 
um, ELM scheme, the Agri-Environment Scheme in England, they had kind of farm clusters, uh, which was designed to do that. But actually, you know, for that good work to continue, you need these farm clusters to be um, funded and continued in the longer term to continue support to support that knowledge exchange. So that's something you know, Plant Life, for example, would be calling for in England. Um, I would say in Scotland, the Scottish Land Matching Service, which is um, supported, so Ian Davidson runs that, supported by the National Farmers Union in Scotland, is a really great place to go if uh, because they actually match up people who are looking for land and people who have land um, and uh, can help also develop the grazing agreements for that as well. So we've used them. So we work as graziers with other landowners. Um, so, yeah, opportunities for new entrants definitely is something, you know, put an advert in your local paper, put something up at the mart if you if you've got a local mart if you've got a local um agricultural supply type shop put something up in the window or on the notice board there there are always people looking for opportunities um and if you're in wales i know yeah farming connect have have opportunities which maybe hillary can can touch on possibly later if we have time perfect thank you both hugely nikki and joe i know there's lots of questions coming in so what i'm going to do i'm going to move on but panelists if you are able can you just Quick, yeah, can you answer what you can? Um, and um, we're going to move on. I'm going to share my screen again. Um, let's go for this. Uh, and I'm going to invite the next two speakers. Um, and let me just wait. I, oh, no, slideshow. Sorry, everybody. There we go. So really happy to inv uh, invite and introduce the next two speakers so we're going to move on so i'll ask um, donald and um, hillary to put on their screens so we're moving now from the cairngorms and nikki to the beautiful island of north Wales in the western isles and Gwynedd in northwest wales so first up is donald norman mcdonald who crops at clachan a croft of 475 acres with 40 suckler house cows sorry and 250 sheep so Donald's going to actually share his management of the Macher in North US. So Macher is a Gaelic word meaning fertile, low-lying, grassy plain, and refers to a unique habitat that is one of the rarest in Europe, only occurring in Scotland and Ireland. So I am going to be doing the slides, Donald. So you just let me know when you want to move, and I will stop my video and go on mute. Hello, welcome. I am Donald Norm MacDonald Crofter from uh, North Uist in the Hebrides of Scotland. And um, it's a family croft. Um, we've been on this croft for 100 years, a third generation crofter. My grandfather came here in 1923. So, um, next slide, please. Uh, yep, yeah. so um, th this is a photo here of our cattle on the, the Macher. This is uh, the area that we crop. Um, it's two-year crop, two-year fallow. It's all silage. Um, so you can see the cattle there. Uh, they got a good view um, eating their silage. Uh, yeah, they're approximately, as you see there, that's uh, 6,000, just over 6,000 crops in the Western Isles and uh, 288 townships. Uh, locally to me, there's 16 crops in the area. Um, I'm number one, Clachan Sands, nine Crofts and Clachan Sands, and the neighbouring township is Newton. Um, we've got a great community. We all help each other out. Um, uh, any issues, carping or um, issues like that, lambing, and we're always on hand to help each other out. So we've got a great community. Um, I've got a, a, a daughter and son uh, who are both uh, wishing to stay in the island, and they love crofting as well. They're great help for lambing and carping, so it's fantastic. Um, we also have a, a machinery group, uh, uh, myself and my two neighbours, we do all like little contracts, uh, cutting silage and grass silage, and um, it uh, works really well. Uh, it shares, shares the labour and the machinery also, because it's uh, one item of machinery is thousands, so it makes a big difference. So as you see there, we've got um, 40 cows and 250 sheep. And uh, the Maha, as uh, Kirsty mentioned, it's uh, this um, thin layer of sandy soil uh, goes from the shore right up to the, the dark soil. But Maha is a whole range of different habitats. 
you know, it, it's got um, there's little buggy bits and, and like that as well. So as you see there too, yeah, a two year crop and two year fallow system. We're in the X scheme, uh, which is a five year contact. So we get paid for doing that. Uh, there's a uh, grass silage, oat silage and whatever. Uh, in our croft here, we've got six different designated sites. Um, so it's, uh, you know, quite, well, not, uh, we have to ask for permission if we have to put a fence or drainage or any sort of activity that we're doing. So we have to run it past to get um, permission to do so. Okay, next slide, please. Sorry, Donald, there's some bit problems. Just give me two minutes. Okay, no problem. <laughs> there we go. Okay, there we go. Yes, yeah, so this is the, the view. This is the, just to the left hand side of, of where the cattle were in the last photo there. So um, this is just looking down there. Um, uh, as I say, the macher there, it's 60% uh, of the, the world's population of macher is actually in the US. So we've got a chain of islands. There's North US, uh, Benbecla, South US, and Barra. So I think it's commonly known as the US. So you can, there's a range of um, causeways between the islands. They're all connected. Apart from Barra, you need a ferry. So 60% uh, of the world's macher is actually in the US. So um, uh, it's a high shell content, but as I mentioned previously, there's there's these damp areas where other uh, flowers are, you know, orchids and whatever. So the biggest threats we see for them are, are uh, the high tide will come in and it floods some of these areas. Um, that's a big issue with the, the rise in the sea. Uh, geese are a major problem because um, they're, they were introduced way back in the 70s and now we have a resident population of greylag geese and they are escalating all the time. And um, when we had a population of 10,000, we had to shoot 4,000 to stand still because the, the, the habitat is so good here. We have so many lochs and um, great, great habitat for them. So these geese are on the grass all the time and they're, they, they know where to go for the best grass. So they're not on the, the crops that aren't used, they're on the, the good macher ground. And I think it's a huge issue for, for all our, our plants and their biodiversity. Um, the other issue, uh, the, the threats are the lack of crofters because um, the lack of cows and the lack of crofters, we've got an aging population and uh, the cattle numbers are also going down, um, which is a big, big um, problem for us because uh, these habitats will, will go because um, uh, if you take one item out of the equation, you know, you've got your, your cattle for the grazing and and if you see, you take one item of the equation, the the other, um, the, well, the, the equation falls to bits really, you know, it, it, it deteriorates the, the vegetation or the rank and scrub. And um, so it's a big problem. So uh, the, we also have to make sure that cattle are profitable, you know, because that is a problem. If people can't afford to keep cattle, the, the habitats wouldn't be there. And um, this habitat that I have here, it's it's intensively grazed, but then you know it, the the flowers come back. So, uh, next slide, please. So um, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, the the cows are out on the. I think it's easier to if I start from when they go back in in the autumn, um, uh, the cattle uh, move off the matter, and um, from the autumn. Um, they go back down. So they, they go back in October time after we sold their calves. Uh, they're down on the, this pasture then till, um, till the spring, till May, they calf down there, we feed them their silage. So then when we take them off in, in May, they're just actually coming off uh, the last few days here. And that allows all the plants to go forward to flower and seed. So there'll be no, no animals on that area then for literally six months. So it's more or less six months on, six months off. So it, it's, um, it works well for us. We are self-sufficient with winter feed. Uh, we grow silage. Uh, we have five hectares that we plant there. Uh, it's a type of macar oat that only actually grows in the islands because mainland seed, you'd have to spray them for deficient uh, with the ground being so, so sandy. Um, I also see there the 
Yeah, so this also provides, you know, lets the the birds uh, also nest and um, you know uh, other chicks there. So uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so we have huge um, numbers of um, waders on the on on the islands here. This is actually on the plowable bit where you see the oyster catchers in among the cattle down there. So um, we actually have 9,000 pairs of waders. Uh, that's oyster catchers, lapwings, red shank, dunlin, snipe, and ring plover. So, so uh, that's pairs. And this is actually only on the Maher ground. And if you go up into the crofts and the in by and higher up, there's, there's more birds. So um, we have a fantastic habitat. And that's all down to the cattle, the management. It's all linked together. And um, we also, the other reason that we have so many, we don't have much ground predation. As you see there in the slide, no fox of thoughts, weevils, weasels, badgers, or beavers. So um, it's, it's quite a unique place that we have, really. Uh, corn creeks are uh, plentiful in, in the US here. We have 300 calling males, which equates to 40% um, of the UK's population. So under the EEC scheme, we have management on that also. Um, we can't cut our grass silage till the 1st of August. And uh, we can't, um, well, we have to cut it concrete friendly manner also. So it's cut from the middle out the words and this uh, allows the concrete to have two broods, I would imagine. Um, uh, we also have concrete corners adjacent to the grass fields so they can go in there when we start cutting the silage. And uh, as I mentioned previously, we have the, the machinery group, so we cut all the neighbours. And when you cut the first uh, grass park, the, the lapwings follow us round. And uh, it's it's so great to see. You can see them following us round from field to field, all the way around, because they can get access in to the feed. And one particular day, a couple of years ago, I actually stopped and I counted 437 lapwings. And um, it's just fantastic to see them. And uh, we're working with them, so it's great. Uh, we also have, um, uh, as I mentioned, the, the flowers there out in the Mahar. We have uh, the a rare orchid. It's the Hebridean marsh orchid. Uh, it's actually on our croft and in the sounding area. So it's the only place in the world that it grows. And uh, this is um, also uh, great to see. And we also have visitors that come and occasionally looking to find this orchid. So, it's um, yeah. Uh, next slide, please. Yep. So on the the fallow and the plowable, we seaweed that gets washed up from the shore. You can see it's been dumped here, and then it's left to rot away, and then we spread it, and then it's ploughed in. So this great, gives great nutrients to the soil, and uh, it's totally beneficial. And even on the shore, you see the birds pulling out the maggots and all the other bird, all, all the other. So it, it's uh, it's more or less an organic system that we have really, you know, um, I would imagine that's why we have so much biodiversity. Um, we, don't, we don't spray the crops, you know, there's no spraying. So all the seeds are in the, in the, in the market as well. Also, I forgot to mention the bees. Uh, we have two rare bumblebees here. We have the great yellow bumblebee and also the, the moscarda. So there um, we see them often and on a lovely summer day on the matter flowers and the and the, the clover and the vetches, you know, they're, they're feeding there. So we've got a huge population of them. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, I think I mentioned earlier, uh, the cattle go back to uh, the, the Macher in October time. And um, so they'll take away all the, the rough grazing and um, take it down. So it's a very low input system we have really. Um, I also have another crop that we use also. So, um, you know, shading, moving the cattle about and the sheep. The sheep aren't on the, on the Macher as much. Um, they tend to stay up higher in the fields and the reseeded areas, but um, no, it, it's um, a great way of life. Uh, next slide, please. No, that's it. So uh, thank you very much for, for your time and uh, thank you, Kirsty. Yes, and Donald, I was um, just going to say, everybody, Donald has got surveys, so he's been part of this floodplain, floodplain Meadows Partnership and the Open University Project 
So he has two very uh, really interesting, insightful surveys done. Um, and I think what we'll do is, we'll, if with permission, we might share them with the PACA resources as well. But it lists all the different species, the plant species on the MACA on dot, at the Croft. And it, yeah, it's quite amazing. So what I'll do is quick do post your questions for um, Donald. I, there is one there asking what is a croft, but I'll let you I'll let you do this. I'll let you answer that one after Hillary's presentation, uh, Donald. Uh, that that could take quite a while, couldn't it? <laughs> so so thank you, and um, I'm going to introduce you all to Hillary next. So this is going to test my Welsh pronunciation now, Hillary. So Hillary and her husband farm at. Biden Esaf, which overlooks the Menai Straits. Uh, they have mountain rights on the Rhinlachlid Common, is that right, <laughs> Hillary? For their Welsh hill flock and Grey's Highland and Belted Galloway cattle and Manx Lochton sheep on nature reserves. So in addition to their farm, they also run a countryside contracting business with their children, which incorporates grazing livestock into the management of the nature reserves for the Wildlife Trust local councils and holiday parks. So Hillary's presentation is titled Practical Creation and Management of Species Rich Grassland and Meadows. And she's going to share how they use grazing animals to create conditions for a range of species and habitats. So I'll stop sharing my screen now, Hillary, and I'll let you start sharing and I'll hand over to you. Is that... Um... Is that sharing or do I need to swap screens? Not Hello? yet, Hilary. Do you want to swap screens? Um, is that working? Not yet. Um, no. <laughs> I can hang on. Uh, let me see if I can get your... Give us two minutes, everybody. Um, Maybe while we're doing this, does one of the panelists want to answer one of the questions that have come up? Maybe Donald, do you want to say what is a croft? And I'll get Hillary's presentation up. Yeah, a croft is a, a small parcel of land. Um, it used to be on a big common grazing, and the croft would be like, say, two or three acres around the house. And then the common grazing would be out towards like the macher, the low ground. And there's, as I mentioned previously, the townships, there'd be 10 crofts in the township, for instance. So your, all your cattle would run with the other township in the, within the 10 crofts, so it would all be open. And the hill would be the same. All you'd have is a little bit of in by around your house. And then that, that's roughly a croft, but it, it's changed now because you can apportion, you can apportion your common grazing and your hill grazing. So it, it's now you can have it as one unit. It, as you mentioned, it's quite complicated, yes. Fantastic, thank you, Donald. Yes, you could uh, you could uh, research crofts and go into crofts in a huge way. Crofting is a really interesting um, system we have in Scotland. It's unique and hugely valuable um, for our highlands and islands. Um, and I know in Scotland, we're also looking to try and extend crofting down to lowland Scotland as well and woodland cross. So yeah, as a system, it's got huge benefits um, for all sorts of things. So yeah, thank you, Donald. And Hilary has sharing her screen. So I'll hand over to Hilary now. So if you just do your slides from beginning, Hilary, and we'll get on. If you got to the... So oh. is, can you see the, the whole screen? No, if you go to your top right hand side, or as I'm looking and say, start slide from beginning, and we'll be able to see All your. Right. There we go, and then we'll be able to see your slides in a bigger format. I think I need to swap which screen everything is on. Okay, not a problem. So your uh, question is, yeah, yeah. I can't find where to do that. Um, so it might be better, Kirsty, if you show show it on your one. Do you know what? No, just just go for it. Go for it as it is, Hillary, and um, we we'll just yeah. But I could fine. go off presenter view. Um, I had a thing earlier that said swap which way round it was. <laughs> I can't find that now. Go for it, Hillary. Yeah, go for it. We can see your slides. We can see your slides. So just if yeah. you can. Hang on a minute. No. 
There we go. I'll just go. Okay. So I'm I'm Hilary Kehoe. I farm with my family in North Wales, and we've got a contracting business that works with the Trunk Road Agency. So this is the um, the map of all the meadows that we've created for the Trunk Road Agency across Wales, and we've used a range of techniques to establish and manage them. So we've had quite a bit of practice, and it's it's really good to have worked with the Trunk Roads Agency to to sort of get all this connectivity right the way across the landscape. Um, we've got a species rich meadows on our on our farm and um, we found that to be a, a really helpful sort of way of increasing our income because we use that for seeding other meadows elsewhere. So just going to go through different steps to meadow creation and how to manage hay meadows. Um, then I've got Trevor Dines's meadow making adventure and a tiny bit about machinery and then some questions and answers. So this is my daughter's meadow um, near Bethesda. And it's just amazing how it goes. In May, it's white with pig nuts. And then in sort of June, July, it's yellow with um, yellow rattle and cat's ear. And then we cut it in about mid-September and by that time it's turned purple. So it's just an amazing sort of uh, array of colors through the year. And using natural seeding, the, the magical sort of local character of the meadows has got with its own unique mix of flora and fauna can really be preserved. So the first step really is to survey what's um, what's there already, because you, if you've got, if you've got, if you come to a new place and you've just got a meadow and you don't know much about it, it's better to sit and wait for about a year and have a look across it and see what flowers and um, animals and birds and things you get there because it it would be silly to just um, sort of annihilate one to, to put in what you think might be your dream meadow and actually you've got some good stuff there already. Uh, you can look in on nearby road verges and field corners to see what plants are there throughout the year because local diversity that makes a meadow different is, is different all the way across the country and you can't just reproduce it with a with a generic packet of seeds. Um, you need to know the soil type and the pH. It's really worth getting that uh, soil analysis done locally. Quite often, farmer stores will do it for nothing because they think they can sell you some fertilizer, but actually, you probably don't want to buy any fertilizer, but just get it done. Um, you want to know how much phosphate and potash there is in the soil, too. And you, it's really good to know about the previous management of the meadow. It, maybe it's been overgrazed, so you can't see the flowers coming through or maybe it's really good and you need to make sure that you can keep on looking after it in the same way. So the ideal conditions are a pH of six to six and a half, unless it's an acid grassland. So I noticed somebody on the chat said that they had acid grassland. So you do need to make sure before you start changing things and, and applying lime, that it's not a naturally acidic grassland that's meant to have its sort of lower range of different species, but they're really special, the, the ones that are just for acid grasslands. Um, meadows need farming, they just need the right type of farming. So lime leaches out of the soil over time and it's often spread on agricultural land to neutralize the acidity to a pH of six to six and a half, which is optimum for plant growth and soil organisms. A low, <clears throat> a low soil pH in a, an acid soil enables magnesium to become mobile and limits plant growth. But you don't want to put a whole load of lime on at once because that can um, smother the sward. So you wouldn't want to put on more than about two tons to the hectare in one application, because then the soil microbial community can adjust and um, sort of start to utilize it. So the, the picture on the, of the grassroots shows the, the sort of the depth of grassroot that you get once you've got the right like, conditions. If um, semi-natural grasslands that are flower rich are naturally low in phosphorus, and you want an index of about one for phosphorus to allow the um, to allow the species rich grassland to thrive. And then for potassium, you want a, a level of about one index. That's ideal for wildlife, for wildflower grassland. Although too much potassium isn't as restrictive to the restoration and creation of wildflower grassland compared to phosphorus. But wildflowers can struggle to compete with more competitive grasses and weeds and soils with potassium levels above two. 
And if a potassium index is not, there might not be a lot of herbage. So you probably need to put on some well-rotted farm manure to maintain the potassium levels. So there's a few secret weapons that um, really help with establishment of wild, wildflower meadows. So the, the plant on the left is eye bright. And then in the middle, we've got yellow rattle and then a close up of the yellow rattle. They're semi-parasitic annuals and they, they really help with hay meadow creation and management. Every spring, the seeds germinate, they're annual plants. And as the roots grow, they tap into those of the grasses growing around them. And water and nutrients are drawn from the grasses and that reduces their vigor and allows other more delicate meadow flowers to thrive in their place. It can reduce grass growth by up to 60%. And then there's a direct correlation then between the number of yellow rattle plants and the number of diversity of other flowers in the grasslands. So after the flowers have bloomed, you get um, inflated seed pods. And when you shake the plant, it rattles. So in the past, this sound was used by farmers as a sign that hay was ready to cut. And once it's established, you don't really need to do a huge amount more. It, it'll spread rapidly, but you mustn't cut it until after the seed's been set, usually after mid-July. As long as seed's produced, it'll fall naturally into the sward and ensure more yellow rattle next year. And the early mowing of grasslands, the main reason why it gets lost. So the first thing to do is to cut and collect um, your grass. We use a Ritec flail collector. It's got, I think, something like 36 flails, the hammerhead flails. And when you do a couple of passes across the field, it'll scarify it and it takes the grass off and then you dump it in the corner to rot down to use for manure again. And that creates bare ground. And you need to scarify to about 60% bare ground, which looks awful, but that's actually the best ratio for successful establishment. Then you can seed it using green hay or brush harvested seed or a proprietary mix suited to your soil type and local plants. So we do a lot of seeding with green hay from local meadows um, because then, then you're getting the plants that are mostly in the area. We use a lot of the Coronation Meadows from the project that happened, I don't know, it's 10 years ago now that Prince Charles ran where he got um, species rich grasslands in every county. Um, but you can also brush harvest from, from a meadow that's got plants that, that you might want. Um, so that's somebody seeding with a seed fiddle there or, um, or we use a muck spreader to spread the seed. Um, then you roll the, the seed in or trample it with livestock, just put a few animals in, well, a bunch of animals in for a, up to a week just to incorporate the seeds into the, the crop, into the soil. And then monitor by walking the site and counting plants, or if you're really keen, use a quadrat. And I've got an example of this later on. And then maintenance, I've got a slide on maintenance in a minute. Our seed sources are 12 donor meadows that we've got across Anglesey, Gwynedd and Conway. And then we've got somebody who collects seed and grows plug plants for us, thousands a year of, of plants from each different area. So he'll just go, go across with plastic bags and a comb and collect the seeds and then take them home and propagate them. And then we can put them in where, where we want. So we put them in along the trunk roads. That's a lot of um, what we do there to sort of get the biodiversity in that. And then Places like Cotswold or Emmersgate have really good seed mixes that you can buy to suit certain soils and uh, local provenance. So some people suggest that plant diversity might become more important with climate change, but most people feel that local provenance seed is best for the local cultural identity. These are just a few of the plants that you might end up with. So common spotted orchid and early purple orchid. It can be really hard to get orchids to establish because they need the right mycorrhizal bacteria in the soil. But if you're lucky enough to have that, and if you've got seed in the mix that you put down, it might take them a few years to come, but they will establish in the end. And then we've got species such as Burnet satsafrage, Betony, Tormentil, and Devil's Bit Scabious. It's, it, you can manage a hay meadow um, and maintain it by using grazing livestock. So winter sheep are great at maintaining them, but they're disastrous in the growing season as they're really keen on the flower heads. But if you don't want to do an annual late season cut, then light summer cattle grazing will maintain the meadow and it can be backed up by sheep over the winter. It's good to let the plants flower and set seed, which they will do if, if, the, 
it's like your cattle graze they'll just rattle them off and trample them in um, but sheep won't they'll just eat all the flower heads anyway uh, in the late summer you need to cut and collect hay is best because seeds will shed as it's turned but haylage is a good compromise if the weather's unpredictable you should always collect a crop because leaving it down will enrich the soil and increase fertility encouraging the more productive grasses which suppress the flowers so Trevor Dines used to work for Plant Life and he phoned me up in about 2015 and said, would we go and have a look about how he could um, restore the field that he'd bought? It was rye grass and clover into a, a flower rich meadow. And he's so enthusiastic and so dedicated that he was really prepared to put a lot of work in. So this is just a really good example of what can be done with a really productive field. So. At the beginning, the field was dominated by Yorkshire fog and meadow fescue with nettles and dock. Not very exciting at all. And this is us um, scarifying it with a right tack. Right tack. This is the first pass. We did a, a few more passes again. And then we used the iron bock, which is really useful to harrow it. So we went crosswise across it. This is going down and then we went across and ended up with the final seed bed, which looks absolutely disastrous, but is actually exactly what the seeds want. We collected green hay from Kaya Tanabolch, which is a local coronation meadow, using the Ritec collector and tipped it into the trailer and then went and put it into a muck spreader to spread across Trevor's field. And also did some brush harvesting on a national trust site locally, which Trevor had identified because that had different plants that he wanted that weren't in Kaya Tanabolch. The seeds were spread out using the muck spreader and then you have to walk across the field a bit and make sure there aren't clumps and just rake things out and then put some sheep in if you can. And this is what the seed looked like on the ground so you could see how much seed was collected and, and just spread with the green hay. Um, somebody put a question up earlier about how much what the acreage you collect from is compared to the acreage you seed. So we usually go collect from half an acre and seed an acre although there are recommendations for a sort of a one to three ratio, but we find that this generally has the best effect. So in year two, there's still lots of grass and there's about 50% yellow rattle in the field and the buttercups are coming through. So Trevor invested in some highland cows to create niches for the seeds to set into and manage the vegetation. And he also borrowed some sheep from a neighbor to graze down over the winter and make opportunities for new plants to germinate. And then in 2017, in the third year, yellow rattle absolutely dominates and the grass is very, very much reduced. In year, in year four, there was a bit less yellow rattle, but other wildflowers were coming, red clover, buttercups and sorrel. And in year five, the wildflowers are absolutely dominating, especially cat's ear and perennial species like oxide daisy, betony and knapweed are coming through. Trevor had a very technical quadrat and he recorded the occurrence of each species in nine cells in 21 quadrats. So that was quite intensive monitoring. This is the field uh, in about 2019. Um, he had over 40 species. The ryegrass was almost completely gone. Um, the things that he that had most increased were things like the, the cat's ear and Betony and vetches, and you can see sweet vernal in there, um, a bit of coxfoot, and all sorts of different finer grasses. He's very excited to find he'd got quite a range of orchids in the field. He'd got um, greater butterfly orchids from Kaitanabal and common spotted, and um, just a beautiful array of, of flowers in his meadow compared to how it was at the start. And his hay crop. Um, this bale yield fell initially, but it's increased to pre-reversion levels now. This isn't always the case, but the more species-rich hay is very nutritious and good for animal health because it's got so many species in it. And it's great for the landscape and the wildlife, so it's probably worth taking a bit of a hit in, in your yield if, if you need to. That's just the hay being tedded. Any questions? Thank you for listening. Fantastic, Hilary. Do you want to stop sharing your screen? And um, I'll ask 
if all the panelists can put their cameras on. That was brilliant, both Hillary and Donald. We've got 10 minutes left of the webinar, um, so do post your questions in and we'll try and get through them. I know that our panelists will be working really hard to answer them as the presentations have been going along. So we have a few here, and the first up is from Michelle Pierce, and this is for you, Hillary. Um, she has three fields of 3.5 acres, and they graze with two barefoot cobs plus 10 sheep plus lambs. Um, Dops good in um, cutting out the scythe. Um, I'll move on to our question. So our question is, is it best to rotate my three fields for species rich hay or to focus on a single field and manage more carefully for species rich hay? So, so is the issue about uh, needing somewhere to put the livestock? Um, let me have a look. Oh. Um, she mob grazes with sheep very early in the season and they will eat down the docks. That's a docks. Um, I'm not sure, Michelle. <laughs> she doesn't say if it's about livestock. Um, uh, I think she's trying to ask whether to stay on, like, should she make everything species rich or just focus her attention on one meadow and, like, keep the livestock in those other ones, I think. Um, well, Trevor bought his cattle and then realised that, you know, well, he fell in love with them. So, so he sort of rotated them across. Um, so he did, I think he grazed them in the summer, likely on the field to still allow it to, to for the flowers to bloom and set seed. And then he, then he rotated to the next field the next year. So he sort of managed to, to do it all really. Um, Maybe I, I I think it's just what do you think, Nikki? I think it's <laughs> <laughs> I think more species everywhere is better. So yeah, I mean I would be looking to increase the species richness of all of the meadows because I think or all yeah. of the land because it gives you more options. Whereas if you become overly focused on that one field, that might then have negative impl like unintended consequences of protecting that one bit might have issues elsewhere and you might end up going kind of backwards so yeah I think I, yeah I think you can I think you can do it all if you've got the right number of animals um if you've got to put your sheep somewhere in the summer then rent some land down the road <laughs> oh, that, that, that's the thing isn't it is it is if it's where to put your summer sheep for us we're really lucky here we put them up on the mountain and well in the winter they manage a lapwing reserve so then they're not in the way yeah swap to cattle good idea <laughs> fantastic um i think yeah as you see there's lots of solutions but really it really is based on your situation your business and your land um so and what fits what fits with you um is anyone up for answering a question about gorse management um how how do we how, how do we manage our gorse and this is from rhoda Rhonda. Uh, Semi-feral ponies elite gorse, um, but they they will only take a little bit. They they won't remove it. I think your best bet is to cut it back in the winter, and just uh, it, it's really nutritious if you cut it and then bruise it and then feed it back to livestock. That's what they used to do all over the the. The country um it's yeah fascinating, it's fascinating cut it plant, back it? allow a bit to grow it's a great sort of singing post for birds isn't it there Crush is a great recommend it. if you don't want Sorry. to um um to paint the stumps with anything then then just keep being prepared to cut it back i was going to say there was a great suggestion in the chat where someone said to if you are cutting it um, if you're not going to bruise it and then feed it, then you can use it as a, basically a natural tree guard for other for regenerating trees or for That's planted trees, because um, anything kind of spiky just will protect them a little bit. Um, I'd also say just piling up, not massive piles, but piles of cut gorse um, when it's kind of died off a bit 
Um, so if you cut it in the winter and then leave it until like now, cattle just love it for like scratching their heads on and kind yeah. of re- and they'll really smash it up and trample it, which then just, you know, obviously it then just adds back into the ground as it starts to break down. So um, I think, yeah, it can, it's a, it's a great plant um, and it has so much benefit for like scrub habitat is something we really don't have enough of, um, but I can recognize that it can become a bit overwhelming it can, and it's can getting get a bit that overwhelming, balance. can't it? So yeah. just sort of agree on some on a limit for it really you that you can do that you know using a drone or something to map where it is now work out what you want and then check it every year to see where it is fantastic uh, yeah um black grass um yellow so would the yellow grass have any impact on it or is it likely to reduce over time if the ground is not cultivated or anything else we can do is there any advice about black grass people on spot here <laughs> i haven't had any experience with black grass at all um no don't worry don't worry um okay um there yeah there's people putting in comments and that uh, to answer this which is brilliant um let's see someone um, wants to know about one. borrowing sheep for winter grazing yes. it's probably worth doing um because they're great at nibbling out ragwort seedlings and and just sort of reducing the vigor of things um you don't need millions and you don't need them for a long time but it's good to sort of end up with a ideally you have a bit of a mosaic of heights of vegetation around the edges for for mammals and things to go and hide in and a fairly close sward by sort of the end of march just um allowing some gaps for for seeds to fall into to to maintain the species richness I responded to Rick, no, but only because he's got Shetland cattle, sensible chap. Um, and I just think his farm is gorgeous. So I don't think you need to do anything <laughs> well, different. If you know that, that's fine. <laughs> so I, I think we could do a webinar and go over some bracken on, on its own, I think, <laughs> which we might need to do, actually. I think, yeah, that there is a call for that. So well, that's us almost near the end. I I would like to just quickly wrap this up, and um, and I'm going to put my panelists on the spot so they can have a last last word each. And I think for me, it's just personal reflections on what's needed to reverse the decline of these valuable habitats. What is the one, not one thing, but you know, one one of the things that you think would actually help to reverse these habitats. So I'm going to start with Hillary, and um, if we move to Nikki, Joe, and then Donald. So there's one one thing. What I'm I'm not hearing you very well. One thing. What what is one one thing that you can think of that can help reverse the the decline of these valuable habitats? What do you think would help? People realizing how much carbon it fixes and how healthy it is for livestock and just what valuable thing it is. And hopefully in Wales with the new sustainable farming scheme if we can if we can be rewarded for having it and looking after it and make it profitable that would be great but you know you can we're finding that selling seed for for roadsides is is 1200 pounds an acre instead of about 100 pounds an acre for sheep so if you get to a stage then you can make it pay but it takes a while to get there nikki um, I think that more people should be funding projects like the Cairngorm National Park uh, Pasture for Life Plant Life Scotland project. Um, it worked really, really well. We've kind of got a model now to take that forward. And for me, it's about helping farmers shift along that spectrum of species richness. So if we can get, you know, if we can go from two species in a in a sward to 10, then we're in we're going in the right direction. So for me, it's about moving the dial not kind of swapping everything to super species rich grassland immediately let's just you know recognize that production and abundance and nature can work together it's not an either or um so yes if anybody is watching from a government department in any of the devolved nations and would like to contribute to funding to those projects then get in touch fantastic joe I mean, more events like this, I've learned loads, but um, with a policy hat on, I guess we need to avoid grasslands being the forgotten habitat. So the decision makers that Nikki just mentioned, they really need to appropriately value grasslands, put the right policies in place, 
not just to help those already interested in the, taking the leap, I guess like lots of people on this call, which is so inspiring, but also to incentivize and support the wider farming community to get interested in grasslands. And finally, Donald. Yes, I would just like to say, just uh, concur with whatever you else said there, but I think um, cattle are, are um, you know, they, they have to be, is a big part in the chain, you know, because we see crops from bit here that don't have livestock on them or, and um, they, they don't have the habitats on the biodiversity that, that working crops and farms do. So I think um, the powers that be have to realise that uh, cattle aren't all bad, you know, they have a, a part to play in the equation. They're integral. Cattle are integral. So, yeah, thank you. So I'm just going to say a huge thank you to our panellists. It's been a fantastic uh, webinar. Um, I'm just going to quickly share my screen one more time um, just to let you know. Um, hang on. <laughs> if you can see that. Just to show you um, the other webinars that are happening this week and just to plug them. So we have um, one on soil tomorrow and farm ecosystems on uh, the 18th and slow the flow on the 19th. So please do sign up and join on our Eventbrite page um, and do enjoy do join in all the social activities um, on Twitter and Instagram this weekend to celebrate nature friendly farming and croft, all the farmers and crofters across the UK who are doing such fantastic work. Um, so huge thank you, panelists. Huge thank you to the attendees for joining. And yeah, we look forward to, um, to the webinars this week. And also please do join the network. It's free to join. Um, it's open to farmers, crofters, uh, land managers, growers, and the public. Um, just look at our website for details how to join. And yes, thank you all once again. Thank you. Thanks, bye. bye.